Hey everyone, it's Monday afternoon and it's time for some Come Follow Me. I hope that today's lesson will be a short little introduction to this block, but I hope it will give you some things to think about as you study Acts chapter 10 through 15. The Word of God grew and multiplied. This has been a great lesson for me to ponder on this week and to think about. I've had a crazy week with a daughter getting married and my son Franklin starting the MTC, but I am very delighted uh, at the things that have happened for my children. And, and uh, well, here goes today's lesson. Last week, we talked about the vision of Stephen while he was being stoned and as he looked steadfastly into heaven and saw Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father. I asked you to ponder the theology question of why does it matter that we believe that the Father and the Son are separate beings with glorified physical presence. Among the things that I hope you settled on, not just the idea that, that uh, Latter-day Saint doctrine is true and everyone else is false, but the idea that comes to us by having deity who inhabit our same space who are able to, to feel, who are able to exist with us, whose hearts beat in harmony with our own, and in whose image we can one day become. I hope those were some of the things that you came to about some of the theological uh, truths that can be understood, understood when we see our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ as corporeal physical beings. Today's lesson is about the vision of Peter, especially taking the gospel to the Gentiles. I'd like to present three thoughts today in our time frame. One is that revelations most often come incrementally. Two is that other people's prayers are frequently answered through us. And finally, that God is no respecter of persons. In this story, uh, there are several uh, different accounts where angels appear to some people like Cornelius and speak boldly and frankly. And yet Peter, uh, the Lord's mouthpiece, the, the prophet on earth, only saw a very symbolic dream that he had to discern and interpret. And it could make us ask the question of why is revelation so complicated? There are a couple things that we ought to bear in mind about our own process of receiving revelation, the same as Peter, the Lord's prophet, receiving a revelation seemingly with as much magnitude as opening the gospel to the, to the rest of the world outside of, of Israel. Elder Bednar taught this idea about revelation. The gradual increase of light radiating from the sun, rising sun is like receiving a message from God line upon line, precept upon precept. Most frequently, revelation comes in small increments over time and is granted according to our desire, worthiness, and preparation. Such communication from Heavenly Father gradually and gently distill upon our soul as the dews from heaven. This pattern of revelation tends to be more common than rare. I think many of us wish that we could have uh, flashing lights and, and heavenly beings appear to us, and then wonder if we're broken if our revelation seems to come more gradually and incrementally. Elder Bednar assures us that, that that seems to be more normal. Elder Richard G. Scott, in a very great talk, once taught us that when we explain a problem and a proposed solution, sometimes he, meaning Heavenly Father, answers yes, sometimes no. Often he withholds an answer, not for lack of concern, but because he loves us perfectly. He wants us to apply truths he has given us. For us to grow, we need to trust our ability to make correct decisions. We need to do what we feel is right. In time, he will answer. He will not fail us. When he answers yes, it is to give us confidence. When he answers no, it is to prevent error. When he withholds an answer, it is to have to have us grow through faith in him, obedience to his commandments, and willingness to act on truth. We are expected to assume accountability by acting on decision that is, in, is, that is consistent with his teachings without prior confirmation. We are not to sit passively waiting or to murmur because the Lord has not spoken. We are to act. I've, I appreciate Elder Scott teaching that 
that uh, sometimes silence from the heavens is a sign of the Lord's confidence and his ability or his desire to let us make decisions and grow through learning. The second aspect of Peter's vision is to recognize that somebody else's prayers are often answered through our actions, just like Cornelius' prayer was answered by Peter receiving a revelation. This makes me think of our beloved past prophet, President Monson, whose life example and stories taught us that in the performance of our responsibilities, I have learned when we heed a silent prompting and act without delay, our Heavenly Father will guide our footsteps and bless our lives and the lives of others. I know of no experience more sweet or feeling more precious than to heed a prompting, only to discover that the Lord has answered another person's prayer through you. In this block, Peter teaches one of the great truths about Jesus Christ is that Jesus went about doing good. As we think about the ways we can walk in Jesus' footsteps, often we want to find ways where we can be more disciplined or more obedient, which of course are not wrong. But what we ought to look for is places where we can do more good, where we can go about acting uh, for good and being the answer to other people's prayers. Finally, this revelation taught that God was no respecter of persons. Throughout the scriptures, we find various references that all are alike unto God, and he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and free, female. He remembered the heathen, and all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. Despite that, religion, uh, often in the history of religion, we wind up separating ourselves. The Gentiles uh, were separated from the Jews at the time of Jesus because Gentiles were the worst. They lived without the God of Israel in their life, worshiping idols, and without law, they were a filthy and immorally impure people. They were the violent conquerors of Israel and were generally just known as sinners. Now, in this revelation, the Lord inspires Peter to call not that which he has cleaned unclean. In other words, that the Lord has chosen the Gentiles and wants them to receive the blessings of the gospel, even though they've not been part of the history of Israel or the covenants of Abraham. They've done nothing to deserve it. In fact, they've done everything not to deserve it. In that, who would you, who do you think, what people, what kind of people fit into the category of Gentiles in today's settings? People who seem different than, than you, than, than me. People who don't live the same standards, who don't have the same values. People who vote differently or, or see global politics in a different light. The people in our world who we think to be absolute deserved outsiders. And in this, in this block of scripture, I would like you to ponder on those people. And if you were Peter... What you feel like is the Lord asks you to minister to those that are outsiders from all religious uh, points of view. One of the writers, uh, one of my favorite writers, a historian from Utah State, Dr. Patrick Mason, wrote this. He said, in order to fulfill its mission to invite all to come unto Christ, our meetings must be a place where all people feel welcome. Smokers and non-smokers, baptized and unbaptized, women and men, the elderly and babes in arms, blacks and whites and Hispanics and Asians and Pacific Islanders and Native Americans and Arabs and everyone else, welfare recipients and billionaires, single and married, divorced and widowed, childless and child blessed, soldiers and peace activists, capitalists and socialists, believers and doubters, straight and gay, every weekers and once a yearers, feminists and non feminists, intellectuals and the illiterate, the groomed and the unkempt those in suits or jeans, and those in dresses or pants, conservatives and liberals, publicans and Pharisees. Think about the uh, that being our definition for Gentiles, and then ponder on how we can do better at taking the hope of Christ to the Gentiles that are in our circle. Certainly in that list, there are people that, that are outside of what you would think of as your normal church group. And here... Jesus instructs Peter to go to those Gentiles and share the hope of Christ with them, which is what we can do. 
Lastly, in the Jerusalem conference, uh, Paul had brought several of the Gentile con converts to this conference in Jerusalem. They were outsiders. They didn't fit in with the regular church members who were Jewish. And there were those who argued that they should be circumcised and they should go through all the rituals of, of Israel before they could become Christians. When this was presented to Peter, the Lord's apostle, after receiving counsel and after thinking through Peter says this from Acts chapter 15, verse 10, one of my favorite verses in scripture. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? What's the yoke, do you think? What is it that Peter is saying that these church members were trying to put on the new converts, which just was unbearable? In what ways, I would like you to ponder, are you and I making it too hard for ourselves and others to be righteous? In what ways do we tempt God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Think about that. I'd appreciate hearing your answers because I'm always edified by your insights. I likewise very much appreciate those who make commentary on the Loom platform so we can all engage with each other. I sure appreciate you taking time to listen to this message. Have a good day, everybody, and a good week. Bye.